Harris has had to perform a delicate balancing act between being a liberal and, for lack of a better turn of phrase, not sounding too liberal. It is Tuesday, September 10th. I'm Jane Koston. And I'm Josie Duffy Rice. And this is What A Day, the show in which we ask critical questions like, why is a debate starting at 9 p.m. Eastern? Also, I have a very smart idea. Why don't they duel with swords? Some like fencing. I think that would be more fun. They should do like medieval times where they like pss, joust? joust on horses. They should yes, joust on absolutely. horses. Absolutely. Everyone loves jousting. Don't you hear all Donald the time Trump how people are would like. would be amazing at jousting. Yeah, and I think Kamala Harris could joust. I have no oh, doubt yeah. that given oh, yeah. a, some preparation, she could joust. He could be the world's oldest jouster. I am almost jousting. certain that he would be the world's oldest jouster. I don't even need to look that up. You don't need to. Mm-mm. On today's show, we say goodbye to a cinematic icon. Plus, we're wondering just how many employees of the mayor of New York are under investigation because honestly, I've truly lost count. I have no idea. But first, Jane, I'm so, so glad to be here with you. I'm so glad to be here with you. Thank you so much. It's okay that you're a Michigan fan. We'll, like, yeah, we'll deal with it. Yeah, it's more than okay that I'm a Michigan fan. It we'll is it among out. the many qualities about me that make yeah, me yeah. so great. Mm-hmm. But let's talk about this debate. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump are preparing to square off tonight in their first and so far only scheduled debate before the election. Before we get into it, let's talk details. Harris and Trump will debate for 90 minutes tonight in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center. It will be hosted by ABC News. There will not be a studio audience. They will not be jousting, sadly. Mm, We don't know. We'll see. Indeed. I know we keep saying it, but the stakes are just massive for lots of reasons, especially for Harris, right? Because for one, we are fewer than 60 days out from the election, which feels wild. Two, need we remind you what an immense disaster the last debate was. Have you blocked it out? I kind of blocked it out. I have no memory of that debate. It's going on the list of things I just refuse to remember. And by by the way, I told you before, I'm happy to play golf if you carry your own bag. Think you can do it? That's the biggest lie that he's he's a six handicap of all. I was an eight handicap. Yeah. Eight. But I have, you know how many? I've seen you swing. I know you swing. President Trump, we're going to turn. Let's run. not act like children. I had completely, I had forgotten just how crazy that was. And you that know was, it's bad when Trump. That's like talent show level unpleasant. Ugh. It's like senior home talent show. That's exactly Ugh. what that was. Sen- senior home talent show stand up. Ugh. And you know it's bad when Trump is the one saying, let's not act like children. That is like never, ever a good sign. Nope. Um, you know, you may remember that President Joe Biden is no longer the Democratic nominee uh, because he bombed so hard that night. Which brings us to our third point. Harris has only been in the race for about a month and a half, which seems crazy because this race has taken years off of my life. And a lot of voters say they still don't know a lot about her. That was one of the major takeaways from that New York Times Siena poll that came out this week, which showed the race in a statistical dead heat. More than a quarter of respondents said they needed to learn more about her before making up their minds. And she'll be up against Trump, who is a notoriously difficult person to debate. Not because he's good at it. He is not. But because he slings a lot of insults at his opponent, spouts a lot of lies the whole time. And let's be honest, the man knows how to make good television for people who are not me. He loves to put on a show, and he'll do whatever he can to try and rattle Harris. So for more about what Harris needs to do tonight to win the debate and win over more voters, I spoke with Erin Haynes. She's the editor-at-large for the 19th. Here's our conversation. Aaron Haynes, welcome to What A Day. Jane, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be with you. So set the scene for us. What should we be looking for Kamala Harris to emphasize in tonight's debate? What policies do you think she's going to focus on? It'll be interesting to see if policy takes center stage tonight. I think the moderators are definitely (laughs) going to try to do that. But I think her main job is to continue to introduce herself to the American people, right? I mean, we've just seen polling that says that a lot of the American people still don't know who she is. I mean, what a surprise. She's had all of six weeks to kind of introduce people uh, to her, even though she has been vice president for, for three and a half years. She's only been the candidate and not the running mate for about six weeks. So uh, I think she'll focus a lot on that. I think she will also really try to hammer, again, that contrast between uh, herself as, as prosecutor and, and former President Donald Trump as somebody who was facing multiple uh, you know criminal charges. And also, I think she probably will try to highlight, if she does highlight uh, policy, 
he should be highlighting Project 2025 and really trying to tie that to the former president and what he, uh, you know, what what that means in terms of what his vision is for for what he would do as president if he gets to go back to the White House. Gender is obviously a big story in this race. There's the obvious history Trump has with literally every woman he has ever encountered. And there's also a massive gender voting gap between men and women of all races. So how do you think Harris is addressing the gender voting gap? And how do you think she should do so moving towards Election Day? Yeah, I mean, I think um, how how and if identity politics kind of plays out on the debate stage will be interesting, right? Um, Kamala Harris, for her part, has really kind of sidestepped, um, you know, issues of, of race and gender, certainly has, has talked about... Um, as part of her origin story, who she is, she has owned that. She's not running away from that piece of it. But in terms of kind of like the history of of, of it all, uh, she is really choosing to emphasize the, um, what she wants to focus on, which is, you know, her argument that she is the most qualified candidate in this race, right, regardless of her race, regardless of her gender. So, um, you know, obviously... A lot of women are very energized by her candidacy. You have a lot of surrogates that are kind of focusing on on her gender uh, and, and the history of, of of all of this. And so I think she's letting kind of letting them do that, do that part of it. Uh, but really just trying to say that she is going to be somebody who is would be a president for all Americans, uh, maybe giving people, regardless of their gender, a way into this candidacy. And, and I think that that really is is what she has been doing headed into Election Day. Harris has had to perform a delicate balancing act between being a liberal and, for lack of a better turn of phrase, not sounding too liberal. What has that meant for her campaign and what does that mean moving forward? Yeah, I think that's really kind of where you get her focus on this idea of freedom, right, which which can mean whatever it needs to mean for a voter. I, I think uh, that, that may be why. It, this campaign has, has been exciting and resonating with so many people because, uh, you know, freedom uh, can mean different things to different people. And it is not, um, you know, something I, I think that it, that was a phrase, you know, just the idea of freedom and, and rights and democracy that, that um, you know, conservatives have really tried to lay claim on and, and that she is really trying to reclaim, but in a way that is not necessarily so partisan. You, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but voters do keep saying that they need to know more about Kamala Harris. Why do you think Harris remains so undefined for so many voters? And what does she need to do to overcome that? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of that is just the role that she's had for the last three and a half years. I mean, even, you know, despite being our first woman uh, vice president, first woman of color vice president, the vice presidency is not a role that the American people traditionally have been very interested in. It is certainly not a role that, that we as a political press has traditionally covered. And so a lot of what she has been doing, she's been doing behind the scenes. And so a lot of people haven't really gotten to know her, have not really seen a lot of what she's been doing. And I think that that is why she now finds herself in the position because she was kind of, um, you know, President Biden's loyal backup number two person. Um, she goes from understudy to, to, you know, main character. And and so now she has an opportunity to introduce herself to people in a way that she really didn't have when she was not the person that was really supposed to be in the spotlight. That's not the job of the vice president, right? Mm -hmm. So let's cut to tonight after the debate. What are three things you'd want to hear that would make you say Harris won the conversation? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, if if she is able to effectively communicate on the economy, the affordability question in a way that uh, makes the American people uh, feel that she understands the suffering uh, and, and, and the struggle that they are facing in, in this economy, despite how well the economy is doing for, you know, so much of the country, but understanding that there are significant parts of the country that are not experiencing that prosperity. That would be one thing. I think um, continuing to talk about reproductive rights and what that means as an economic issue, as a freedom issue, if she's able to articulate that while also kind of pointing out that, you know, former President Trump's position on abortion remains unclear, right? If, if, if she is able to kind of draw that distinction, I think that that would probably be something that her campaign would certainly classify as a win. And then I think, I don't know if it's anything specific, but but to the extent that she is able to do what I know her campaign certainly wants her to accomplish, which is to really get under President Trump's skin and kind of show the difference between 
the two of them uh, and, and the dynamic, frankly, that I think a lot of us have seen kind of playing out, uh, especially with him on True Social and, and the kind of per more personal attacks that he has taken against her. Like if that happens in real time, uh, I think um, that will not necessarily be a good look for him with a lot of the American people. And, and that could be considered a victory for Vice President Harris as well. Thank you so much for joining me, Aaron. This was a great conversation. So great to be with you. Let's do it again soon. That was my conversation with Aaron Haynes, editor-at-large for the 19th. Now, let's get to some of today's top stories. Headline. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. <laughs> Remember that? I wish I didn't. But in an on-brand yet uniquely unhinged social media rant over the weekend, former President Donald Trump threatened to jail anyone who he believes is involved in cheating in the 2024 election. Trump started his True Social post by saying, in all caps, cease and desist. I guess because he knows that's a legal term. He also falsely accused Democrats of engaging in, quote, rampant cheating and skullduggery in the 2020 election. The list of people who Trump says could face, quote, long-term prison sentences if he's reelected include political operatives, donors, and corrupt election officials. All of this is, of course, extremely ironic, considering it was Trump himself who asked Georgia's Secretary of State to, quote, find 11,780 votes so that he could overturn the election results in 2020, which is literally cheating. The commissioner of the New York Police Department is stepping down following allegations of corruption that have enmeshed both the commissioner, Edward Caban, and his twin brother, James, who runs a firm that offers security to nightclubs in New York. And all of this follows FBI raids on multiple officials with close ties to New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who is already dealing with investigations and indictments surrounding his 2021 campaign for mayor. Even the New York Post is mad at Eric Adams for his alleged corruption, and if there's anything the New York Post is generally okay with, it's corruption. During a church appearance on Sunday, Adams himself compared a situation to that of the biblical character Job, who was beset by terrible disasters in order to force him to prove his faith. And so I had my Job moments. And those Joel moments are never going to go away. But I've learned to turn on my GPS, my God positioning satellite. Sometimes you got to let go and let God. Reporter said to me this morning, you know, oh, you feel you're being persecuted. I said, no, I'm just in my Joel moment. And when you come out of your Joel moment and your faith is intact, you will receive blessing tenfold. However, as I recall from Catholic school, Job did not get involved with Turkish straw donors and nightclub security guys. Some Republicans are sounding the alarm about the number of staffers on the ground in critical swing states, according to new reporting from The Guardian, with some GOP officials comparing the effort to that of a midterm election rather than a presidential race. The Harris campaign, which is flush with cash and probably putting a campaign volunteer in your kitchen right now, has more than 350 staffers in Pennsylvania alone. But the Trump campaign has been playing catch-up, largely using super PACs to get canvassers and door knockers out to voters while reducing efforts in states like New Hampshire, Minnesota, and Virginia. There are a couple reasons for this. When the Trump campaign took over the Republican National Committee, a ton of people responsible for voter outreach, you know, a thing that's pretty good for campaigns that rely on voters to do, got fired. And Trump decided he really wanted to focus on finding mass voter fraud rather than voter outreach, because, as you might know, he's kind of convinced that's why he lost in 2020. And finally, James Earl Jones, the voice of Darth Vader and Mufasa, winner of two Emmys, a Grammy, an honorary Oscar, and two Tony Awards, passed away yesterday at the age of 93. From films like Field of Dreams and Coming to America, to appearances on The Simpsons, Jones was one of the best known and best loved actors of his generation. And I am legally required here to mention that he was a graduate of the University of Michigan, class of 1955. RIP and go blue. And that's the news. Josie, there's something that's been on my mind. Tell me. Semaphore reported that a mysterious group of paid right-wing influencers organized on Zoom aimed to push creepy sexual messages about Kamala Harris online. And even former representative and scandal lover George Santos thought the effort went too far, saying on X 24 hours after leaving the call, oh God, make it stop. That is almost exactly how I responded when I read the story, Josie. I mean, I feel like going after women has just worked so well for the Republican Party for a few years Famously. now. So why not just... Why not just really lean up? into it? Yeah, I just think, you know, what people really want to hear is that uh, Kamala Harris is some sort of something that is creepy and sexual. 
you know, especially I would love to hear that from a 78 year old man. I always right. think that's what I'm looking for out of a president. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been missing. I needed more of that. Not enough of that in my life. That is all for today. If you like the show, make sure you subscribe, leave a review, add election result denial to your debate bingo card, and tell your friends to listen. And if you're into reading and not just rewatching Return of the Jedi like me, What A Day is also a nightly newsletter. Check it out and subscribe at crooked.com backslash subscribe. I'm Jane Koston. I'm Josie Duffy Rice. Thanks for joining us. Bye.